No, I didn't get into a lot of fights. Goodness knows I wanted to get into fights, but I also knew where my strengths lie and it was not in throwing them hands, okay? <laughs> Hey, hey, hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Journey to Purpose with me, Erica Lasan. And this week we are continuing with our theme and conversation about learning, living, and loving as we dive into talking about how your word creates your world of possibilities. This week we're going to be having a super juicy conversation because let me tell you, everything begins with the word. <laughs> and I don't want to get too much into it right now because... This is something that I could go on and on and on about. So instead of talking about it, let's just be about it, okay? It's time to get into the conversation. This conversation was inspired by that phrase, sticks and stones. Y'all know that saying? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words could never hurt me. Now, for those of you who may not know that common phrase, odds are you probably weren't teased a lot as a child, but I, my friend, was, okay? I got teased so much when I was younger for being a dark-skinned girl, like a really, really dark-skinned girl, for being a first-generation American. So I got teased horribly and called names like African Booty Scratcher, Black Diamond, Tar Baby, and all the other horrible things that kids can do sometimes when you're younger. And in addition to this, I was a little bit on the big bone side <laughs> in my younger days, and so I got teased a lot. And so that phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me, was one that a lot of my teachers and a lot of adults um, instilled in me. And no, I didn't get into a lot of fights. Goodness knows I wanted to get into fights, but I also knew where my strengths lie and it was not in throwing them hands, okay? <laughs> so I use the phrase to empower myself. But now as I'm looking back as an adult, we all know that sticks and stones is a load of bull, okay? Because sticks and stones may break your bones, but words definitely hurt people. And even worse is that sticks and stones may create like physical hurt, but the words that are used to hurt people have way longer lasting effects. As the bruises may not be visible, but they last a lifetime. They may not hurt you with the impact, the physical impact, but I'll tell you a couple of things that they definitely will do that some of these adults may not have considered, okay? Words may send you to therapy. Words may keep you in bad relationships where you're afraid to establish boundaries because you are afraid of not being loved. Words may have you second guessing who you are, the value that you bring to any table, and the purpose that you were created for. And what's more is that words will have you doing a whole lot of self-development and improvement work in your 30s, okay? Trying to make sure that you are not passing down the same hurt and trauma that you yourself have ingested since you were a child. Words most definitely have the power to hurt you. How many of you as adults can relate to carrying words that were said towards you and now trying to break yourself from the mental hold and the effects that those words may have had on you? As a child, the words that are spoken of you, towards you, or at you have the ability to create your identity. We build our identity based on the things that we're told about ourselves and the way that people perceive who we are. And if you hear something enough times, you then begin to believe it. I wanna get a little bit more into this, but I also wanna share a little bit about what inspired this conversation, aside from like some mild childhood drama, okay? <laughs> so this conversation is inspired by a couple of things. One is the fact that our words have the ability to influence the visions that we're able to create for ourselves. But two, I was listening to a recent sermon by Jackie Hill Perry, who's an author, a speaker, a teacher um, of the Bible uh, and the Word. And she's also a mom of now almost four children. She's a really wonderful influence. But I was listening to a sermon of hers on um, YouTube about the power of words. And I just found myself given like, poetry snaps like yes Jackie let them know Jackie and so apparently I was really excited about the topic the third thing that made me want to speak on this today is the fact that I'm reading this really awesome book called the four agreements 
And one of the first and major agreements is to be impeccable with your word. And the way that the author breaks it down really makes you understand the way in which your words have the power to influence everything that you do, but more importantly, why you shouldn't be willing to break your word. Not with other people, but more importantly, with yourself. And all of these things also got me thinking about a group accountability challenge that I did with my company um, called the Celebrate Eve Challenge back in February and how we really spoke about the power of your word and setting intentions and then living in alignment with the words that you speak over your life. As we're talking about living and learning, the way that we learn is through words. And I mentioned this because I'm a parent. And as a parent, I understand the beauty of being a child. As kids, we hear, see, and trust everything that we're told to be the truth. It really is an example of the type of faith and trust that we need to have as adults. I also want to share a little bit about my experience in understanding the power of words and the ability to create a life that you desire, not only for yourself and your children, by using the power of your words so I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a story time okay taking you way back to my childhood it comes as no secret that I am Nigerian American my parents are from Nigeria but I grew up in Baltimore Maryland and I was raised in a very traditional Nigerian home and when I was younger I I almost feel weird saying this I, I it even makes me uncomfortable talking about it but like when I was younger my parents didn't understand the power of their words there would be moments that my parents would be frustrated and I understand this now as an adult looking back but as a child I really didn't understand where they would say like really hurtful things or like speak very negatively and they would say when they would ha be angry they would say things like oh shut up or if I did something wrong they'd be like how could you how could you be so stupid or they would <laughs> say things in Yoruba like um olodo which means idiot or omoale which is like calling someone a bastard and I feel really weird. You see how uncomfortable I am even talking about this as an adult, right? For the longest time, when I would hear things like that said to me or about me, it was almost like my spirit would internally reject it. And in my mind, when I would hear things like, how could you be so stupid? Or why would you even think to do that? In my mind, I would say, well, I know I'm not stupid or I know I'm not dumb because why, if I'm so dumb, why am I getting good grades? Or when they would say like, oh, Lord, do whatever the thing is again calling someone an idiot in my mind I would think well if I'm such an idiot why did I get a scholarship to go to this elite private school because I know I'm not dumb I know that I'm really smart and it's almost like every time I would hear these things about me this like negative talk towards me in my mind and in my spirit I would state the opposite little did I know at that point I was affirming myself like treating my spirit and my soul with very necessary needed affirmations and i don't share this to like make anyone feel bad or to like put my parents on blast and as an adult i can reflect on the experience very differently as an adult i understand my parents were frustrated as an adult i i, I know that my parents love me um there's this really funny um podcast that's done by Ivan Orji and Lavi Ajayi and it's called Jesus and Jalof. And they, one of the first episodes they talk about how Nigerian parents have a completely different type of love language, okay? They're the like five main love languages and then they're like the, the love language of Nigerian parents, which is basically um, expressing disappointment and, <laughs> and like, calling people out of their names okay and it's not because they don't care and it's not because they don't love us it's just that they want to push us to be our best selves that doesn't make it not toxic you know but when you grow up knowing it and you don't know any differently you just come to understand this as the way that things are and I totally get that as an adult I can now reflect on that experience and know that my parents loved me they wanted the best for me and they just wanted to push me to be my best but as an adult who is now a parent who's raising children i understand oh these are probably things that my parents experienced as a youth 
I came to understand that the words that my parents spoke towards me weren't because they were mad at me or angry, but it's literally all that they knew. They didn't know how to speak to their children any other way because that's how their parents spoke to them. That was the culture and the environment that they grew up in. So they just taught from what they knew. But being that that experience as a child didn't sit well with me, when I became a parent, I knew that I wanted to do things differently with our children. And I just remember when I was younger, a lot of times when I would feel a certain type of way towards my parents, I would take to my journal. I would journal a lot, but I would only journal when I was angry. And I just remember feeling like, I don't ever want to do this to my kids. You know, I don't ever want them to feel this way. I don't ever want them to be like angry journaling about me after hours when everybody else is sleeping. So when I became a mom, um, I made it a point to really be mindful of the words that I speak towards my children. So like, I never tell my kids to shut up. Like there may be moments when they're like super loud in the background and like they're playing on my nerves because there's so much noise, but I would never tell them to shut up. I always say, hey, you guys are being too loud or can you be quiet please? Or can you take it down a notch? You know, expressing that I, I would rather them like take it down a couple of decibels, but not in a way that would make them feel as though they aren't deserving of expressing themselves. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? I don't know why this conversation is making me so uncomfortable. I, <laughs> I, I, this is making me feel really itchy for some reason. I've done over a decade of self-development and self-improvement work. And even now, as I am a joy strategist slash life coach, and I work with other people in helping them find their joy, I've come to understand the power of words and how healing they can be. And this is a really big part of of why my mission with Journey to Purpose is to transform the world through radical joys by way of open conversations and healing experiences. Because the moment you are able to express yourself through your words, you're really then able to shift the energy and then create healing, not only for yourself, but for the people around you. So I state this because as an adult, I've had conversations with my parents, talking to them about the ways that they spoke with me as a child and how it affected me, um, though they may not have realized it in the moment because to them, their words were simply their words. Like they had very big feelings and they just spoke them as they felt them. <laughs> and, and it's so wonderful how having children will create um, a space for having these conversations because there was one particular event that acted as a catalyst um, to open the door for conversation with my parents. It was a couple of Christmases ago when Nick and I took the kids down to Maryland for Christmas. And there was one evening where Aria would not go to sleep. Like she refused to go to sleep. She wanted to hang out with the adults because all of us, like my whole family, was downstairs in the living room and we were just talking and having a good time and whenever we go to Baltimore we like we always stay up late like everybody just disrespects their bedtime <laughs> and like we'll stay up till like two three four o'clock in the morning just talking and it was probably almost 11 p.m. and Aria just refused to go to sleep because she wanted to hang out with grandma grandpa and everybody else and she came downstairs and she just kept asking why do I have to go to bed I don't want to go to bed, but I don't need to go to bed. But why do I have to go to bed? And to every question that she asked, I took the time to answer it. I actually chose to engage in a conversation with Aria about why she needed to go to sleep, the benefits of her going to sleep, and um, how much better she would feel by simply going to sleep. And at some point I was kind of like over having the conversations and then Nick just went upstairs and spoke with Aria and tucked her in and stayed with her until she went to sleep. But after Nick came down, my father made a comment and the comment was, you guys talk to these children too much. You guys just want to have conversation with the children. You know, why do you feel the need to like talk to them so much? And that led to a conversation with my parents about how I felt as a child where there would be moments where I would want to have a conversation or there would be moments where I'd want to express myself, but I was never given that space. 
And this isn't a conversation that's unique to me and my Nigerian upbringing. I've had plenty of conversations with other adults from other cultures around the world, um, even black Americans, where they talk about how in the households where they grew up, it was a matter of children being seen but never heard. You could be present, but you couldn't engage in the adult's conversation. You didn't talk back to your elders, and that's something that I instill in my children because I don't believe that you should talk back to elders. I do believe that there is um, a level of respect that has to be had um, for the people who are older than you. But I also, as an adult, understand that a lot of times children are just having these conversations because they're curious. And the way that we learn is by asking questions. The way that we receive answers is by asking questions. And a lot of times I think about this even beyond um, the role of parents and, and children. Like I think about and this is me bringing it back to faith, but I think about us as children being children of God, you know, the Father, God, the, our Creator. Prayer is something that we're encouraged to do in having conversations with God because God is a relational God. He wants to experience relationship in a way with us where we revere Him as our Father, where we fear Him as our Creator, with all of his omnipotence and all of his power, you know, there should be a level of fear that we have and reverence that we have and all that we have towards him. But at the same time, he also desires that we want to know him more. That's the reason why he encourages us to read his word, to learn more about him. And if we have any questions, we're then able to ask him those questions and put them before him in the form of prayer. And then he begins to work in our, in our minds, in our bodies, in our spirits, in our environments to answer our questions through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And none of these are bad things. I am a firm believer that we are meant to ask questions. When the Bible talks about believers who have childlike faith being those who enter being those who will enter the kingdom of heaven, I honestly believe it's because when you have childlike faith you have childlike trust when you are a child you ask questions when you are asking questions you're admitting that you don't know everything and that you want to learn more about all of the things none of these are bad things and the moment we begin to experience this as adults that's the moment that we really then lend ourselves to um activating our joy because there's a continual learning process but we're also then able to embrace freedom because as adults, one thing I think we have really messed up in our minds is that we need to have all of the answers. And that is absolutely not true. It's not our job to have all of the answers. Only God can have all of the answers. Even with all of our learning, with all of our understanding, with all of our knowledge, we will never understand the everything in its entirety. That's not our job and it's not our business to know those things. God knows those things. So anytime we have a question, we are meant to ask him and in accordance with his desire for us to have an understanding of that thing, he will give us the answers in his way and in his time. I feel like I'm getting a little off topic here, so I'm going to bring it back in. You see how excited I am about just curiosity. I love learning. Um, and this is something that I, I believe that once we as adults get back to this position of understanding our need to be learning on a regular basis, it'll just make life a lot more joy filled for a lot of people who don't, who aren't necessarily feeling the joy in their everyday living. So going back to this conversation that I had with my father, um, and my mom was there too, so then it became a conversation with the full family just about why Nicholas and I choose to have these conversations with our children. And it's really to let Aria and Jace know and any future children that we may have that we value their opinion, that we value their thoughts, that we value their presence, that their voice matters and it should be utilized. Even if it's something where we don't necessarily agree with um, the way in which they're saying something, we'll let them know. But that doesn't mean that what they're saying isn't of importance. And the thing that happened next kind of blew my mind. As we were having this conversation with my father, he then began to share with me and my siblings um, a little bit about his experience growing up as a child. You know, he didn't necessarily agree with our approach initially, but the more he thought about it, he 
stated that he wished that he would have been able to have that type of relationship with his father growing up in Nigeria. And let me tell you what else came of that conversation. Healing, you know, and just understanding my father a little bit better. And my mother also shared some of her experiences too growing up in Nigeria and kind of what framed her mindset and the way that she raised us. And it also brought me a lot of peace and understanding. It was never about me, though I kind of gathered this through the years of self-work that I've been doing, but understanding why my parents use certain words that they use, but also what their experience was that led them to um, parent me the way that they did. You know, it was a very healing experience for everyone that was involved. At the end of the conversation, it was like we had a whole family group hug. We ended it in prayer. It was beautiful. In a lot of ways, we all need therapy. <laughs> We all need therapy, we all need conversation, and we all need to heal. Um, and I don't know, man, at some point, I'm pretty sure that our children will probably have some conversations about how we raise them because it's all a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. I wanted to hop into some solutions for helping you really implement and activate the power of your words. Typically, I put joy gems at the end, but I have joy gems that are directly correlated to some of the solutions that I'm gonna be sharing with you guys. So I wanna make sure that I give these to you in tandem. The first solution that I'm gonna share with you guys today is to remember that words are the foundation of creation. Your words have the very power to create and manifest whatever it is that you desire. When you think about God and his ability to create the world, everything that God created began with a word. God used words to create the heavens the earth and everything that exists <laughs> and that we see and know today. It's all up and through Genesis 1. So I'm gonna read Genesis 1 to you guys real quick. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Then in verse six it says, and God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so, God called the expanse sky. In verse nine, it then says, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then in verse 11, it says, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. Like, yo, it blows my mind how amazing of an artist God is. He didn't even say or direct what the seed should produce. He just said, and let it bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. You know what that shows me? It shows that like literally God said something, but as he thought it and as he saw it, it then appeared. Of various kinds, there's no instruction, there's no direct um, direction as to the various kinds, but God is such an amazing, awe-inspiring creative that as he sees things, as he thinks them, as he believes them, as he states them, they just automatically appear. So good! Then in verse 14 it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the great light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. In verse 20, God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. 
So God created the great creatures of the sea and with every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. In verse 22, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. Then in verse 26, God says, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over the creatures that move along the ground. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In verse 28, it says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Chapter two, verse two. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Y'all, yeah. oh my gosh. There is so much that could be said about that one chapter alone, but I'm not gonna focus on all of that. We see in chapter one and the very beginning of chapter two that by simply utilizing his words and of course like his power and his breath and the spirit of all that he is, God was able to not only create the world, but everything in it. We also see that God created man in his image, which means that a lot of the things, a lot of the qualities, a lot of the traits that God possessed, he's also given us access to. Also through Jesus, but hold on, I gotta take this kid to the bathroom real quick and then I'll continue this conversation. We're back for a third time. <laughs> we have been given the same power to create things with our own words. But we also need to rely on our faith to believe that the words that we are speaking actually carry the power that they hold, okay? In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it talks a lot about faith. And it says, uh, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And this is one of my favorite verses. If you guys have been following my journey, if you follow me on social media, if you have been following my vision boards, you know that Hebrews 11.1 1 was my anchor verse for last year, 2020. And so many amazing things came um, into my life as a result of trusting and believing this word, this scripture and these words for what they are. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Like, do you understand the power in that? When you're certain of something, you have unwavering trust that what it is that you are speaking forth or whatever it is that you are believing for is actually going to happen. Or not even that it's going to happen, but it actually already exists. It, you just aren't aware of it. You just visibly don't have access to it at the moment. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And then in verse three, it goes on to say, with support, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Literally everything that we see right now was not a factor before God spoke it to existence. That is the power of words to create the tangible out of what is intangible. Oh my gosh, I could go on talking about this forever, but I'm not going to. Solution number two. The second solution I wanna share with you guys is to understand that words carry a transfer of energy. Understanding that those same words that we experience as, our, as children carry energy that can follow us into adulthood. And it takes a lot of reprogramming and unlearning to leave that energy in the past. So the second solution is to think about your words as seeds and understanding that they can plant 
and manifest whatever it is that you sow. But in the same way that you can plant detrimental and destructive words as seeds, you can also plant words of affirmation, words of love, words of empowerment, and whatever you plant is what you will grow in the garden that is your life. Speak those things about your life that you actually want to see. And I talk about vision all the time. I talk about manifesting visions all the time. But you do this by first creating the vision. Talk about the things that you want, not the things that you don't want. Are you mocking me? <laughs> Joy gems that correlate with this message can be found in James 2 verses 14 and 17 where James says what good is it my brothers if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds can such faith save him in the same way faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action is dead and a lot of times I think what happens is that a lot of people say that they believe things but then they don't take actions that then support the words of their claimed faith let's just call it that because faith without works is dead and our works as believers as children of God simply needs to be the act of obedience moving in conjunction with the Word of God and in alignment with what his spirit is calling us to do y'all get what I'm saying words carry a lot of power but words without action sometimes just stay words they have the ability to create a lot but faith is something that creates action when you move in obedience Oh gosh, I hope I'm not complicating things. The third solution that I want to share with you guys is to understand that your words influence your actions. I guess I'm getting to it anyway. And this is the reason why affirmations are so powerful. A lot of people do or say affirmations and they say the words, but they don't actually believe the words for what they are. But you really have to believe the words, trust the words, experience the words that you are affirming for yourself in order for there to in order for them to create the action that you desire. So going back to this sticks and stones metaphor that I've been talking about all day, while you may not be the one throwing the sticks or the stones, understand that your words have the power to influence others to throw the sticks or the stones. But at the same time, you also have the power to influence others through your words to tell them to put the sticks and the stones down. And it's for this reason that I believe that your words are some of the most influential things that you possess because they inspire action. And for me, it really comes down to this golden rule of treating other people the way that you would like to be treated. There's a joy gem. <laughs> There's a joy gem that I wanted to share with you guys that supports this and it comes from Luke 8 verses 43 through 48 and this is one of my favorite stories from the Bible it's about how Jesus healed the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and it says as Jesus was on his way the crowds almost crushed him and as and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years but no one could heal her she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped who touched me Jesus asked when they all denied it Peter said Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said in verse 46, someone touched me. I know that power has gone from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and now she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Oh my goodness, y'all, this gets me so excited for so many reasons. But as many times as I've heard this scripture, it wasn't until this year that I really understood the gravity of what took place in that scenario. This woman that had been bleeding for 12 years spoke to herself. Those words that she spoke to herself created a thought. Her thoughts then led to the action of her reaching to touch the end of Jesus's garment. Jesus's disciples said to him, Master, anybody could have touched you. Jesus responded by saying, no, I felt energy leaving me. The thing that gets me so hyped about this is that her words, her thoughts and her actions then inspired an energy 
transfer. It created an energy transfer from Jesus to her. And this also brings me to the fourth solution that I have for you guys. And remembering that your words set people free. Your words can set people free. In the same way that they can keep you bound and trapped and, and limiting yourself and your beliefs, your words can also liberate not only yourself, but others. I experience it firsthand all the time where there may be something that someone is, is sitting with silently in isolation and shame and they don't want to share it because they don't want to be judged they don't want to feel as though they are less than they don't want people saying or thinking certain things about them and so they harbor these feelings to themselves and isolate themselves and the moment they're able to release that through conversation with someone else that automatically sets them free it sets them free because they're not bound by the shame that and the fear that holding those things may have once held on them but the more beautiful part of releasing the thing through conversation is that you're then able to understand that you're not in this alone more than likely there are other people who are experiencing the thing that you've experienced or have experienced the thing that you've experienced and the way that you actually find your way to freedom is by sharing so that you can get the help that you need to deal with whatever the thing is there's another verse uh, well it's really all of james 3 and i started to kind of touch on this earlier but it talks about how life and death are in the power of the tongue and i want to read the whole chapter but it's a lot and this episode is already very long but the main thing is understanding. All right, fine. I'll read a couple. I'll, I'll read a little bit. In James 3, verse, starting in verse 5, it says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is set itself on fire by hell. Verse 7 says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. In verse 9 it says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Essentially what those scriptures are talking about is the power to create life um, with our tongue, but also destruction with our tongue. And there's one more scripture that I'd like to share on this subject, and it comes from Proverbs 12. I'm giving you guys so many joy gems today, but I can't tell you how inspired I was by all of the things. This comes from Proverbs 12, verse 18 and it says reckless words pierce like a sword but the tongue of the wise brings healing actually i don't even think that that needs explaining your words your words can pierce someone they can hurt them very badly or they can inspire healing i mean need i say more but i will say one more thing and this is the final solution that i'm going to share with you guys and i think that is pretty evident at this point when you are looking for affirming words, words of life, even when you don't necessarily feel them yourself, look to the word. And by the word, I mean the Bible itself. Look to the word of God to root yourself in God's promises. And the reason why I think that this is so important is because God's words are truth. They are absolute truth. In a world where we can say that so many things aren't absolute, the word of God is an absolute truth. Like this right here documents not only all of history, <laughs> but it also explains so much of like how the world runs and why. It's grounded in truth because it was written and made by the creator himself. So if you are looking for words of truth, if you are looking for words of life, if you are looking for words that will influence you to create a world or manifest a world um, that bears good fruit, this is where you should look. Look to his promises. The same promises that he spoke to Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham still apply and they apply to you. You just have to begin to speak them over your life and believe them as your truth. If you don't believe it because of yourself, 
Believe it because God has promised it to you. Believe it because God has said that it can be so. And in saying all of this and, and really relying on God's word to strengthen you in your moments of weakness, the final solution that I have for you guys is to acknowledge where you fall short and ask God for his guidance. Ask God to guide you in finding the words to support you where you feel weakest and to also guide you in understanding what words you need to speak over your life in order to head in the direction that he actually wants you to go. There's a verse from um, Romans 12 2. I'm going to read it to you guys real quick that I think is a really solid joy gem to lean into in considering this. And it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're not perfect, right? No human is perfect. Like any human that says they're perfect, that is, isn't Jesus, is a liar, okay? And um, that's also being super self-righteous. But when we understand and acknowledge our weaknesses, that's the moment that we can call on our Creator. That's the moment that we're really then inspired to um, find relationship with God Himself. And that's when He's actually able to do His best work. It's not just a matter of attaining success, but what you want is sustainable success so that you can repeat whatever actions are needed so that you can reproduce that success over and over and over again. And I think that that's what's so beautiful about this particular scripture is the fact that by renewing your mind, you're really then able to embody what's necessary so that it's not just a temporary fix, but it's really a lifestyle fix. <gasps> Y'all, I have shared a lot. But before we end this episode, I would love to hear a little bit about you guys and how you utilize the power of your words. Did you guys grow up hearing sticks and stones may break your bones and words can never hurt you? And what is the greatest thing you've manifested or created by utilizing the power of your words? I would love to know. Let me know in the comments. We've come to the end of this episode and I know that I've said a lot and given a lot of food for thought, but I also hope that this conversation has been beneficial for you. If it has, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube or subscribe to wherever you happen to be listening if you are listening on an audio streaming platform. But in addition to this, I would love to invite you guys to subscribe to my newsletter because I'm going to be sharing some really really wonderful announcements in the coming weeks, including the fact that we have our Journey to Purpose Dream Academy opening up in a couple of weeks. And the Dream Academy is something that used to be called Journey to Purpose Vision Casting. A lot of people don't recognize the power of creating a vision, but it starts with a dream. Right? And everybody has a dream. If you'd like to learn more about me and how a journey to purpose could help you, please visit the site ericalassan.com and there you'll find a ton of resources as well as the link to um, join the waitlist for the Journey to Purpose Dream Academy. You can also follow my Journey to Purpose over on Instagram at Erica Lassan. I hope that you guys have a great week and I look forward to chatting with you guys next week as we continue this journey together. One feel good thing at a time. Until then, bye.